Hello. Hello. Fancy seeing you here. <laughs> yes, I'm very impressive. Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm late. I kind of um, was getting ready and then I realized that I hadn't actually thought about what I was going to say and I should probably do that. So what are we talking about? Right, I should probably send you the question. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep, I prepared this part well. Um, <laughs> so, the worship service on Sunday um, is a, a chance for leadership of the congregation to just tell some stories about what the last year has been like. We're asking the same four questions. So far I've talked to the, the rest of the staff members um, and the board president um, and, uh, and, um, and me. Um, I think the idea uh, for this service came from one of the people I live with. I think her name is Stacy. <laughs> um, yeah, she sounds smart and pretty. It's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just posted in the chat box the the four questions that were sort of um, framing this conversation around. <laughs> so so my hope is um, that uh, you can ask them to me. So it's not just me like doing something that I'm sure they do in radio all the time of, of just pretending like you're interviewing yourself and recording. Uh, Cause that's a little, that's a little grim. Okay. Well, so then let's start from the beginning. What's a moment from the last year that represents what the year has been like? Well, um, cause I often forget to do this with other people. Um, and I forgot it in the questions. I'll say, I'm the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, since 2017, I have served as the minister of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. A moment from the last year that represents what the year has been like. Um, so there was, a, there was a period last summer. It was probably July-ish. Um, where I was sitting down to figure out what the preaching schedule would be like in the coming year, in sort of the fall of 2020 and, and the spring of 2021. Um, and, uh, and it's tough because it's the first time I've put together a, a preaching schedule that's fully online, um, as was the case for, for most of us. Um, but I remember sitting at my desk and having sort of an aha moment, which was that uh, for for guest preachers um, and, and guests in general, we were no longer um, bound by the constraints of our geography. Nebraska is a long, I, I, have, I have said to my colleagues often that Unitarian Universalism is a little thin on the ground in the state of Nebraska. We have three congregations in the state, five if you count lay led fellowships out West. Um, and so that makes it pretty hard to do things like pulpit swaps and, and guest preachers. But now, all of a sudden, as we were planning worship in the fall, we, that wasn't a constraint. And so in the last year, we've had guests in our pulpit ranging from Fred Wooden to Catherine Clarenbach to um, Kendall Gibbons. Um, and if you're... <laughs> just those three names, those would all be banner names um, to, to get to come out to Nebraska to guest preach once in a decade. Um, and so it's a pretty exciting thing and it's opened up other possibilities like you know, Brandy Mimitzrayim and I um, preached simultaneously both at, at Quinn Chapel and at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln um, this spring. And that just would not have been possible in previous years. Um, so it was a moment that started with, with really a, oh, I've never done this before and ended with a, oh, wow, this allows us to do things that we couldn't have dreamed of a year ago. And, uh, 
And in some ways that's been the story of the year. There's other stories as well, <laughs> but um, we'll save those for after worship. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, what is one place we've fallen short in the last year? Yeah, this is, this is the real uh, tricky question for everybody when we've asked this. So in my doctorate program, they talk about two different kinds of um, challenges. They talk about technical challenges and adaptive challenges. And technical challenges are ones that might be difficult, but they have a, a discrete fix that once you figure it out, you can, you can fix the problem and make it better and move on to the next problem. Adaptive challenges are um, bigger issues of culture change over time with a whole lot of variables going into them. And we've had a lot of both <laughs> in the last year, um, but, but to take two examples, uh, a really pretty straightforward technical challenge for us is, has, been the, um, has been the technology piece of it. And actually, Stacey, you and I were talking about this the other night. Um, that in a lot of ways we're, we are trying to present um, a, a, an experience that is uh, at a professional level using consumer grade equipment and nobody that's professionally equipped to do uh, deep video and audio work. Um, we have we have no audiovisual prof professionals on staff, or at least we didn't a year ago. I think we could probably call several of our staff members audiovisual professionals at this point. Um, but that's a technical challenge, right? Those are those are skills and tools that we've had to to pick up, and we can tell pretty well when we're doing it well, and we can tell really well uh, when we've done it poorly. The adaptive challenge has been more just how to hold the congregation together as a community. And that's harder because there are some times that I think we've done it really well. And there are some times where I worry that we haven't. Um, and it's really hard to get feedback on, on when we have or when we haven't. Um, a, lot, uh, a lot of the challenge for me is that I really, I, I miss the receiving line. Like when, when I'm, <laughs> When we're in the church, in the receiving line, I can see 150 people file out of the sanctuary and tell what the mood of the congregation is, right? I can tell if things are going well, if there's something bubbling under the surface that I haven't quite heard yet. And that feedback loop doesn't really exist right now. Um, you know, I, I get emails when people are either at a 10 or a one, but I, I miss all the like two to nine feedback. Um, and that's hard. And that, that makes it hard to, to get ahead of, of this challenge of being a community um, well. Doesn't mean we don't do it. We, we try really hard to, but it's, it's harder in this format. Yeah, and it occurs to me too when you're talking that this idea of falling short, I mean, that's a very broad definition, right? Like falling short on mass versus probably what's your definition of falling short, which is if, if one person falls through the cracks, then you've fallen short. So I also think that doesn't have to make it into the service, but. <laughs> yeah, well, and this is this is in other interviews, so so we don't need to put it in, but one of the things that's come up in a couple interviews is how much we, um, how much is us falling short and how much is the reality of the pandemic, right? There's two dozen people in the congregation who don't participate at all in, um, in online services because they don't like or connect with online services. Is that the church falling short or is that the reality that online services are what we have to do right now? Right. Um, Either way, the impact is the same, you know, regardless of what our intent as a church community is, we still are not serving those two dozen people well. Maybe it's not possible to uh, in this moment, but. But that's not also 
something that you as, as a, a minister or you as a church is going to be particularly comfortable with. That's not going to be something that you lean into as an excuse or write off. No, it is not a comfortable place to be. <laughs> <laughs> as you have heard at length <laughs> over the years for the oh, last yeah. year. <laughs> so on the flip side, what is a success that we've had as a church in the last year? You know, I, I really think I have to um, just highlight the the work and flexibility of the church's leadership. This is the the staff whom the church pays as as leaders have all gotten handed jobs, tasks, portfolios vastly outside their job descriptions. They're not even approaching what they thought they were going to do a year ago. Um, and and if, I recall, if I recall, you have some pretty strong opinions on that um, as a matter of course. <laughs> I do. I do. I was, I'm actually of the, of the management school that one should never give a task that's not in a job description. So this year has been particularly <laughs> neurosis inducing for me um, on that. Um, but um, the whole staff, I mean, Gene, Chelsea, Bob, Kelly have all, all gotten handed these things and, and run with them. Um, likewise, the, the board and program council have all learned new ways to meet, new ways to make decisions, new ways to handle congregational meetings, new ways to look at our budget, um, new ways of conceptualizing what what it means to be a, a church in the midst of a pandemic when we don't have a building. I mean, that's... <laughs> Providing pastoral care? Yeah. Oh, yes, we've learned a whole new language of pastoral care. Um, and that's, that's really been a remarkable thing to watch. Um, and that's not to say it's, we haven't argued and we haven't had moments of tension and difficulty, but it's one of those things where if, if we got through a year of a global pandemic and within the leadership team didn't have moments where we were arguing and having tension and difficulty, we'd be asking what we were doing wrong because we clearly <laughs> wouldn't be putting enough of ourselves into the work uh, if we were all just kind of getting along all the time. So it's really, it's been remarkable to, to work with that group of people um, and, and to to really be inspired by their work every day. Yeah. What opportunities do you see emerging from this year? Yeah, I forgot about this question, so I didn't prepare anything for it. Um, <laughs> I don't know, opportunities for the coming year. I was talking to Bob the other day. I don't remember if this was in his interview or not. Um, but there's this feeling right now as the pandemic comes slowly, slowly, slowly to an end. Um, that's almost like a electricity in the air before a storm um, where, you know, folks have spent a year or more by the end of this um, relatively socially isolated. And the church as an institution is one of the few places where people of all ages, all backgrounds, all walks of life come together and, and share space and time with each other. In a real way, that's been what's been missing over the last year, not, not just at UCL, but in society as a whole. So, so there is this feeling that, that, we're, we're poised on a moment for churches and other civic institutions and, and concert venues and restaurants and every, <laughs> every institution that depends on people wanting to gather and make meaning together. Um, that's really exciting because as hard as the last year has been, it's also taught us a lot of different skills to, to communicate and do outreach and be more nimble and respond to both crises and opportunities really quickly. Um, 
and that will serve us well, I think, in the coming year. I don't know. You've you've been um, you've been watching for the last year. Do you see any any particular opportunities coming? Um, you know, it it is hard to predict the future. You know, I I have been of the mindset that in some ways this pandemic there there was always this fear right of continue of, of prior to the pandemic, social disengagement, right? People getting more and more insular, failing to connect in person, living their lives online. Um, And in some ways, the pandemic forced the rapid and extreme version of that. I know there's a phrase for that. Um, And it turns out with, with, with that acceleration and that dramatic, like there's no options, you have to live your lives online and, and really don't even have the option of emerging. <laughs> um, seeing jokes that even even the the biggest introverts are kind of over it. Yeah. I think that there's going to be a renewed appreciation for human connection. That people are hungry to see each other and will know the value of physical presence in a way that maybe they've forgotten over time. And so the last year and a half is it's well year, but there have been a lot of losses. But I think we've learned something from the pandemic about how much we need each other. And that there's a good chance we could see that reflected in community engagement and maybe more people wanting to know what that weird church with the social justice signs <laughs> outside has to say. Um, so, you know, there, there will be some ground to make up when we return to in-person services, right? I mean, we, you know, the Unitarian Church of Lincoln was really on an amazing path. Not only had you converted to two services, but they were going well, um, you know, and, and to have to pack up shop and, and come home and hide, that was a loss. Um, and, and from the vantage point of your partner, that's something that you feel acutely every day. You may not say, you may not talk about it all the time, but you mourn for the loss there. And I, but I am optimistic that the Unitarian Church of Lincoln will get back to that place. This was a, a setback. It wasn't the end. And it could be that you get there and make up that lost ground much quicker than, than you could even hope for. So um, as long as we're recording, I kind of want to push back because I know you had, and obviously you can shop all this out. Um, for that first question, you had a really beautiful response about like, that you could bring in celebrities, like this is the benefit of the pandemic. Um, is there, I want to challenge you, is there another moment that represents what the last year has been like for you? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I was just thinking about that. There's, there's this one um, where uh, I was talking about what the last year has been like with my wife and it was on zoom while we were eight feet apart from each other. There's, there's that. This is actually the second time we've done that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, Cause you're right there. Um, You know, it's really hard to narrow it down to one. I think Kelly had a really beautiful answer about um, early on in the pandemic, having, having to figure out frantically Googling, how do I video edit (laughs) about four hours before a Sunday morning service? Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's representative of the whole year. It's almost, it's, I mean, it's kind of an unfair question um, because there are things that are quasi-representative, right? Like the technology piece. I mean, the fact that 
you're sleeping six feet from where you work and spend your whole day. Um, the fact that our your office looks like a space station. Um, the weddings that you did masked with three people or the funerals that you held virtually. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. There's been a lot of moments. I think, I think one of the enduring sort of sense feelings or mem uh, sense memories, feeling memories is, is going to be staring at uh, an email on this screen and wishing I could be with the person on the other side of that email, either to celebrate with them or to, to mourn for them, but just to be physically present. I mean, that's such, such an enormous part of ministry is when you have nothing to say, just shut up and sit there and, and make your presence known even if there aren't words. Um, that super doesn't translate to email. It just, <laughs> silence on an email chain just looks like you're, you're not there. Um, so that, will, that, that one will endure for me as a memory. There's no like one moment that I, I can point to or, or want to in a video for worship, but, um, but that's one. Um, you know, and then conversely, like moments of moments of connection that happened online, even um, even in this disconnected time, like the, the the run on baked goods for the minister's discretionary fund that happened last spring. Oh, that uh, was so fun! That was yes. fun to watch. Uh, yeah, Elizabeth Meyer made made incredible baked goods for a while and uh and some people got into bidding wars <laughs> <laughs> and we never got one we, we never bid we... i ate them all is the thing <sighs> we did at least once I'm, I'm you're right you know what you're right and and you know what and we we needed to bid more we weren't fast enough on the trigger we weren't, oh. we weren't. <laughs> yeah um Yeah. And then there's like looking out the first couple of times we were online, but other people have already used that. So that's why I didn't go there. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I no, I and use or not use any of it. I just wanted to challenge you because there is something about <sighs> this tension between there is new possibility in worship, but it's hard to know. Oh, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's. You've got me thinking about like five years from now, what is the sight or the smell or the song that instantly transports me back to this period in our lives? Um, I wonder if the keep going on song, I mean, that's probably going to be solidified as COVID anthem status. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the song for me is pretty easy because early on, early on in the pandemic, one of the first songs that, that um, Julie and Bill and Bob laid down was, mm -hmm. was Julie Ederson singing Comfort Me. And she just, just nailed it. And, and it was the first, one of the first times she overdubbed herself with, harmonies and, and I remember listening it for, listening to it for the first time and going oh wow we're we're gonna play this once a month for the duration um and we have <laughs> we really have and, um, and, and I'd also chime in too with Michelle's recording of Go in Peace at the end of Vespers because I mean that's a, every week every yeah. week that's played and it never fails to get five comments. The there, are, there are some folks who come to Vespers. Um, I, I know this because they've told me when I, when I haven't played that song uh, that come solely to, 
<laughs> solely to hear and see that video. Um, not, not, well, that's not anything new, not anything that I say, but they're here, they're here to see a friend of theirs play music. Yeah. Um, anything, uh, while you have me and the recording's going, anything else that you think you want for this service? Do you have any other answers for any of these questions? Places we've fallen short, successes we've had? Because you've had a front row seat to this <laughs> more than more than most anybody else. I have. I mean, I think one thing that it's hard to, to recognize because when you're in a system, you're the, you only know that system and, and maybe in participating in church, like it's, you don't have that cross. Section. I mean, I, I see that the Unitarian Church of Lincoln has embraced technology and really tried to lean into professionalism and technology in a way that I'm not sure that many other congregations have the capacity to do, you know, with the exception of those that may have a much higher budget. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen daily updates. I haven't seen additional weekly services on top of Sunday. And so, you know, for better or worse, the, the congregation has really tried to over communicate and lean in. And, and I, I understand if that, um, you know, if online worship doesn't work for, for people like that, just like, hey, frankly, that, you know, online stuff doesn't really work for me. Um, but the goal was particularly for folks who are isolated, you know, the daily updates aren't about you wanting to hear yourself talk. The daily updates, particularly when they started, were that people were alone. And if you didn't have a roommate or a family, for my mom, seeing you once a day, particularly early on when we were all so scared, that was maybe the one contact point a day. And so I think that was in many respects, a, a, a huge success, very labor intensive. I will observe because I can, um, but yeah, you know, for wherever the, the church may have fallen short and I don't doubt that it has, it wasn't for lack of trying. Um, I think one thing that, you know, in hindsight, has, has been difficult is that you know you can't choose when things happen you can't so, so you no one could have chosen a pandemic but then no one could have chosen that a pandemic would have then run into a huge racial reckoning in our society in all of our institutions um, and I think everyone, has done the best that they can to say, okay, well, we can't just put these conversations off until after the pandemic is over. You know, we have to do what we can with the tools that we have. But these conversations that require us to re-examine every facet of our lives and um, explore ugly truths about ourselves and our relationships with each other, these are decidedly not conversations that should be happening online, yeah. you know? And, and so I know that there was no way to sort of put it off. You don't want to punt. We couldn't punt. We can never punt. And I think we're realizing we can never punt again, that these are conversations that are going to be with us. But I, those, those conversations with our pods and beloved conversations, they would have looked and felt very different had we been able to be with each other in person. Well, I know I um I scheduled time with you for <laughs> ten to ten thirty, and it's now ten forty two. So, um, thanks for your time. Sure thing. Love you. Love you too. <laughs>